So hello and welcome to another episode of Interviews with Experts. I'm Frederick Dunn and today my special guest is Hilary Kearney. Hilary is the author of Queen Spotting and The Little Book of Bees. She's also the creator of Girl Next Door Honey, a beekeeping business that offers educational opportunities to hundreds of new beekeepers each year. She maintains the blog Beekeeping Like a Girl and her writing on bees has appeared in Modern Farmer and Grit magazines. Her work has been the subject of features in Huffington Post, Vogue, Mother Earth News, and other outlets. She rescues wild bee colonies and manages around 90 hives in her hometown of San Diego, California. In this interview, Hillary shares about her beekeeping journey as well as her soon-to-be-published new book, Heart of the Hive. Thank you for joining us. Here's Hillary. I'm Hillary, and I'm in San Diego, California. I have my own beekeeping business, and I'm happy to be here. Great. So thanks a lot for being here, Hillary, and I appreciate It's okay to call you Hillary, by the way. Uh, yes. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad you agreed to do this interview because um, I wanted to know a whole slew of details about what you're doing out there in San Diego for years. And we both uh, have a history kind of with the Flow Hive and with the um, the Anderson family there in New South Wales. And that's kind of, I think, where I first saw you was when you were doing a review of the Flow Hive 2 Plus, I believe it was. And so we kind of all are in the same category there, but we're backyard beekeepers. And I understand you actually not only manage your own bees there in San Diego, but um, you manage beehives for other people. How does that happen? In other words, how do you end up caring for bees for other residents of San Diego County? Uh, So one of my things that I do for my business is that I offer um, maintenance of other people's hives. So there's this, some people just want to have bees, but they don't actually want to be beekeepers. Um, so they, they hire me to take care of their hives. I tell people it's like, I'm like a pool guy, but for bees, I just come and tend the bees and then I'm on my way and I have my little route that I'm going on. So I'm just, I'm going around to these different neighborhoods and I'm stopping at these different spots and checking on um, other people's hives. And then uh, I have a few of my own hives. And I also manage bees for like the San Diego Zoo, and the San Diego Natural History Museum, and um, a couple of corporate clients as well. So yeah, I'm busy. That's really fantastic. I'm kind of interested in something just said the San Diego Zoo. Mm -hmm. Uh, Where are they keeping bees? So they have um, a new insect house that just got built. They completely remodeled the kid zone. And okay. one of the features of it is a this very cool insect house. And what's really cool about it is that I got to be involved from the beginning design point because uh, the entomology team at the zoo came to my intro to beekeeping class way back when, maybe 10 years ago. And they hired me to train uh, the entomology team to try to get them up to speed on taking care of bees because they had a traditional observation hive that they couldn't keep the bees alive in. Um, They were having a lot of problems with it. They had some different volunteer beekeepers managing it and they just couldn't, they just kept dying and it was just having a lot of issues. So I convinced them to do top bar hives um, in the new insect house and they just have a long, uh, window in the side. And so it's kind of like these two top bar hives, like embedded in the wall with these windows and then a uh, red light. And then they have a, a mirror on the bottom. So it reflects it. And so you can really see what's going on, uh, mm-hmm. inside the top bar and it has windows above it. So, and the bees, you know, the top bar hives are on a balcony, and so we go in through this back door and we go out onto this balcony and we inspect the top our hives and um, we open up these windows so everyone can watch us do the inspection while we're out there. So it's really fun. Um, and that was all kind of like my brainchild and now it exists in real life, which is cool. That's outstanding. Was there any consideration for special lighting or anything like that? <clears throat> they just put, you know, red strip lighting in there. Hmm. It's 
fine. I, I often wonder about the red lighting thing. I mean, that's kind of the standard when you have these display observation hives is to do red light because the bees can't see the red light and it's not disturbing mm -hmm. them. But here in San Diego, we have open air hives that are just, nothing is around them. They're literally just comb hanging from a tree and they can survive that way because the climate is so good. And obviously that's light, that's daylight, you know, on them all the time and it doesn't mm -hmm. bother them. So I often wonder, like, does it really need to be a red light? What would happen if it was just a regular light, mm -hmm. you know, um, mm -hmm. that just turned off, you know, and at just have time. like a day and night cycle, but otherwise yeah. have regular full spectrum lighting. So like if I had been in control of it, I would want to experiment with that. But I mean, it's a red light. It's fine. You can't really see it that well. But when we open it up, you know, when I do my inspection and stuff, I'm like mm -hmm. pulling up the combs and showing everyone through the windows. I keep trying to get me, I keep trying to get them to give me a microphone so I can talk to people because mm -hmm. they can't hear me. So I'm like yelling through the glass, like, it's the queen. And okay. people are like oh, waving that's at cool. me and stuff. I'm like, yeah, you would think they'd put a lavalier mic on you or something like that. I don't know. They've been having a lot of technology problems with the new build. So maybe it'll okay. come eventually. And how long has that exhibit been available to the public? I think it's been a year. A year. Okay. Yeah. And that's at the main park, not like the park safari. Mm -mm. No, it's at okay. the regular zoo. Okay. That's cool. Man, there's so many things I want to talk about. All right. Um, so the other thing is, by the way, you hit on something that no one has mentioned before already, and we're five minutes into this. Providing a beekeeping service uh -huh. for people that don't, because this works for aquariums. I don't know how long you've been in San Diego, but I used to work for Seifert's Aquarium, which is in North Park. And we did custom aquarium installs in San mm -hmm. Diego because there were people, and then they didn't want to maintain their fish. So then there was another a secondary company that actually got too busy. They drove Volkswagen buses. They had the fish logos on the side. All they did was aquarium maintenance. Hmm. So we're kind of assigning the same thing. They want the benefit of having fish around. They want, you know, they just don't want to deal with the dead fish or cleaning out the tank. And now we've got people that want bees on their property, but aren't comfortable caring for the bees. Does that become the bulk of your time spent is, is shuttling around to all these different locations? And how did they find you? And what kind of person do you think now wants bees on the property, but then really wants to be kind of hands off and just wants to enjoy them in the garden? Who are the people that are asking for that service? Um, so I think there's, well, I guess I should clarify that I have this program where it's like, it's a maintenance program. So there's some people I never even see them and I just go manage their hives for them and then I send them updates. And then there's some people who like to watch, you know, I go and they stand back and they just watch mm -hmm. and they'll ask me questions while I'm there. And then there's some people who I'm actually mentoring. Okay. So, so some people have me come every month and they get in a bee suit and just stand there with me while I'm doing it and try to absorb what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. But they're just, they're probably never going to be confident enough to take it over on their mm -hmm. own. You know what I mean? So it's like, I'm kind of mentoring them, but not really. And then there's some people I'm mentoring more intensely. It just depends on the person. So there's this whole range of people. I would say the ones who are, don't want to be involved are usually, you know, fairly wealthy with large properties. They mm -hmm. often have orchards. They often have a lot of mm -hmm. fruit trees and they just want the pollination uh, benefits or they just feel that they should have bees because they have so much land. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, there's people who do it because they just think it's very cool and they like to have the honey. But almost everyone is, it's mostly people who want pollination. Um, a lot of people just want the pollination. We can grow so many things in San Diego, like we can grow all kinds of crazy fruit and mm -hmm. things that you can't grow other places. And there's a, a lot of people have, you know, different fruit trees in their yard and they're just, con you know, they just want them to do well and you do get more fruit and it does, you know, get mm -hmm. bigger and allegedly it tastes better according mm -hmm. to some studies. So, um, you definitely get more, you know, when there's bees in the yard. Do you go up into the mountain areas like Julian? Is that, is there a place called Julian there? There is a place called Julian. It is a yeah. mountain area famous for apple pie. I don't yes. really get up there. I have been convinced to go up there for 
you know, a bee removal every once in a while when someone begged me or to mentor someone, but right. I usually don't go, I definitely don't go up there for maintenance. It's too much. It's too far. Yeah. And it's a pine, primarily pine forest up in there. Yeah. And we get snow. Uh, yeah. There's actual yeah. snow up there. So it's kind of different beekeeping up there too. Okay. So I have to, I'm sure anytime someone interviews you, they take you back. Where was your first bee? What was your first experience with bees? So. Um, when did you first find yourself in the company of bees in a way that inspired you to do this yourself? Um, so I actually, when I was in college, I, my now husband was studying environmental science and I was studying art and we both went to UCSC and he had this bucket list, like this handwritten bucket list on the wall that said random things he wanted to do in his life. Like ride my bike across the country, become a firefighter, get goats, get bees. I was like, Oops. get bees? What? So like out of all the things I was just like, bees, I didn't, I don't know why, but I just didn't really ever think about the existence of beekeepers. I knew about beekeepers, but I thought they were just like this ancient thing that no one actually did anymore. Like they were all from the 1800s and now they were dead and that didn't really happen anymore. Um, and so when I realized that people were still keeping bees, um, I, I just kind of Googled like beekeeping books and I found Kim Flottam's, uh, book backyard beekeeping. And I went mm -hmm. backyard beekeeping. That means we could do it in our backyard. <laughs> um, and so I bought that book for him, like, Hey, maybe we could get bees sometime. And, um, I read it just to make sure that it was good. And then I, the whole section like on the bee behavior was what really got me. This was before the whole movement of like save the bees and the bees are in trouble. That wasn't right. really happening yet. Um, mm -hmm. So it wasn't born out of that. I just was fascinated by the behavior of the bees, the whole superorganism, everything that I read in his book about how they lived. I was just kind of blew my mind. And so I was in this, I was actually in this class called Animals in Writing where, um, because I didn't minor in writing, but I did take a ton of creative writing classes. Um, and this class was like just exploring the relationship between humans and animals in writing. And so I wrote a paper on bees, you know, on bees on that topic and kind of came at it like academically just mm -hmm. out of my own interest. And then when, after I graduated, I moved back home and I moved in with my dad and that was when the recession was happening and no one could get a job. And I definitely couldn't get an art job. That was like, pff, no one, you know, no one wanted me. I didn't have any experience. The recession no. was happening. People were getting fired. Um, so I kind of got stuck at this crummy office job that I absolutely hated. It was killing my soul. And I was just looking for anything to do that would make me feel alive. And so I kind of went, I looked at my dad's backyard, which is huge. It's like a canyon backyard. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could have bees here and no one would even know. And so I started researching it more intensely, like the beekeeping part. I got on YouTube and I watched all these YouTube videos. And um, I don't even think, you know, I read... Kim Flottam's book, but I didn't read any other book. I just got on mm -hmm. YouTube after that and got on B source and I was in all the forums and stuff. And somewhere mm -hmm. I learned about top art hives and got really into that. And so I found plans and I made my dad, I asked my dad to make me a top art hive and he did. And then I just said, can I put bees in the backyard? And he said, yes. And it was like, he was barely done with the top art hive. And I had, put, I was so excited. I put an ad on Craigslist saying, if you have bees, I'll come get them. And I had been watching YouTube videos on how to catch a swarm. And I, I didn't even have a bee suit. I just, I had like, my dad was like, what are you doing? You're going to get a swarm right now. Well, I'm going to come with you. And he doesn't know anything about bees. He hadn't yeah. even read the books. Yeah. You know, he hadn't even done any of the research, but he came with me. Yeah. And um, we both got stung and we went too late at night and we pissed off the bees and we didn't get the queen. And uh, we didn't realize, you know, they started building comb and stuff. They stayed, but they were queenless. So that was my first lesson. And then uh, after, I just kept doing it. You know, I just kept doing it and failing and doing it and failing. And I, I did go to the local club um, meeting, you know, to try to meet other beekeepers. But I was the youngest person by probably 30 years. I mean, it was I was like by far the youngest person. Everyone was like, what are you doing here? Um, I was one of the only women. And I was 
they were really like naysaying the top art hive. They were like, you won't have any success with the top art hive. And they were being Mm -hmm. really condescending to me. So I kind of stopped going after that. I didn't really have a mentor. There was one guy who kind of answered some questions every now and then um, that I could call, but I just kind of went out on my own. And um, then I started, you know, getting in the newspaper and stuff. And I kind of, I had started my own business and I started having this reputation and they invited me back and they were like, can you join the board? And I realized all of my beekeeping students were coming and joining the club and influencing the culture in the club. So by the time I rejoined the club, I had like infiltrated it with my own thinking already because all of my students were in the club again. So it was, yeah, it was just kind of organically happened, but yeah. Yeah. I, I like that story a lot. In fact, this whole dynamic of walking into a club that's so set in their ways that if you're not keeping bees in the specific hive design that they've adopted, that you're out. Uh, I've always thought that was a terrible thing to do to people. Uh, stay open-minded and let them learn and maybe talk about their merit or the challenges that you're going to have with a different hive design. But shutting somebody down or making them feel you know, just so incapable based on their hive choice is a terrible thing. I do want to mention one thing, though, for because people are also listening to this on iHeartRadio. Uh, you mentioned Kim Flottam, and a lot of people did have his book as their very first beekeeping book. He passed away this last week. So, um, in fact, I was scheduled to interview with Kim Flottam, but he was a terrific influence on so many beekeepers. And that little book that you described used to be handed out at bee clubs and uh, bee classes for many, many years, for decades. He was just a goldmine of information for all of us. And he did a book called uh, Natural Beekeeping. And it, funny enough, has the top bar hive and all the different hive designs in it. And so um, very good books by Kim Flotham. But I just wanted to mention that we're all going to miss him a lot, that uh, he was a great loss. And he was only in his 70s. So not to bring you down, but... uh, I I know. I I, I heard and I am sad. Yeah. But it is kind of awesome that his books get to live on you know that is one of the coolest things about getting to write a book I think is that you get to continue to influence people for who knows how long absolutely and and he would not have been one of the people that shut you down for your hive choice (laughs) so so that's actually a really good start and I like the idea that you did this kind of quiet takeover by infusing that culture with maybe I'm going to guess that some of your students are younger people not not, Not really. really. Most of my students are older than me. Um, and I do take a special delight in mentoring somebody who looks like they're the seasoned beekeeper and I'm teaching them. It's like okay. so funny. I have a couple of, I have one student who somebody said he looks like Prince Charles and he really does. <laughs> he's an older guy. He's got white hair. He's got this cool mm-hmm. facial hair and he's just a very chill guy. And, you know, well, if people saw us together, they would assume that he was teaching me. Um, So it's just kind of, it is fun to get to do that. But people pick up the hobby of beekeeping late in life a lot, I think, because Mm -hmm. that's when you have time and you have money to burn. And, um, you know, so, and and those are the people here who have land because land is such a hard thing to have in San Diego. Oh, yeah, in San Diego, absolutely. You know, having a yard with enough space to keep bees is not something that young people have access to. So yeah, I didn't have a yard. We had tropical, uh, tropical gardens and a little peanut shaped pool for goldfish and nothing to mow. So the climate, the climate there. And yeah, it's too expensive. Why do you think I live in Pennsylvania? Can't, yeah. can't, can't take it there, but that's a real interesting starting story. And, uh, I'm glad that you're out there teaching people because I've I've read your books. I have them, and we'll just mention them real quick. We did mention in the opening this book, Queen Spotting, which if and I've recommended this through my YouTube channel in the past before we even talk, so that makes it totally legitimate. And then we have the Little Book of Bees, which is artistic, but it also has really cool bee facts in it and stuff. And this is timely because Christmas is coming up. And uh, if you've got a young beekeeper, as I do, I have three grandsons and uh, two of them are serious about beekeeping. They love bee facts. And this is an example of a book that's like that. Also, kids are competitive. 
So if you've never seen this book, Queen Spotting, it has pages that you fold out and you can challenge your kids to spot the queen first. They love that. And I can even show them the same page two days in a row and they act like they've never seen it before. So, and it's of course embedded with lots of B facts. So really good stuff. I'm really glad by the way, Hillary, that you did these books because, and the art too. I think art is inspiring for kids. Um, I think some people look at a book that's completely painted or illustrated or watercolor work and things like that. And then they might bypass a little bit. So we're going to yeah, talk that, a little bit. Pardon? I was just going to say that little book of bees is very deceptive because yeah. it looks very light and fluffy, but I crammed a lot in there. I mean, you they did. wanted it to be light and fluffy, but yeah. I really didn't go that direction when you read the text. Oh man, I, I didn't mark the page, but you mentioned light and fluffy because it talked about uh, bee species in here and how people could name the bees. And one of them was named the fuzzy headed bee or something. Fuzzy, yeah. It, I, fuzzy it, face like, bee. bee or... cute fuzzy face. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just people that name bees, you know. I mean, so just in case anybody wanted to get a quick look the illustrations are fantastic but as you said it's deceptive because there's real good information in the text so it's a win 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 all the way around so now are you still a member of that beekeeping association Do you have time for that i am i don't honestly go to the meetings unless i'm speaking at this point um i kind of i was on the board until covid happened and then you know i had a kid the same year that covid happened so that, and that's my first uh, kid. So it was just pretty intense year. And I just was like, no, I don't want to meet in person. Um, so yeah, I'm in the club technically, but I only go if I'm speaking usually. Okay. Well, so you're contributing at least. Yeah. I think that's great. And I do want to talk about something else. Um, because of the flow hive, and there are a lot of people you talk about getting a reaction to a beehive. Uh, as soon as you say flow hive, some people just hit the door. But um, you did travel to New South Wales and met the Anderson family and saw some of their bee arts. Would you like to share a little bit about what that trip was like? Was that your first time to Australia? That was my first time to Australia. It was pretty cool. I mean, it, the Sydney beekeepers contacted me because they were having a conference and they wanted me to speak at the conference. So they contacted me to see if I'd be willing to travel out there and speak at their conference. And then the Melbourne beekeepers found out that I was coming and they were doing a conference like the following day. So it was like, okay. So then I was speaking at two conferences and then the flow hive people found out I was coming and they were like, can you come up to see us and we'll fly you up here and we'll do some filming. And I was like, okay. And this whole, actually we had booked tickets to go to Australia for our honeymoon because my sister-in-law was living there temporarily for like a couple of years for work. And so we were going to go visit her and turn it into like a honeymoon. And it just got completely co-opted by beekeepers and everything became like, we have to go here because beekeeping. And now we're going here because beekeeping. And so um, it, it's kind of funny that that happened, but he knows who he married. So it's pretty typical of something that would happen to us. And it was a lot of fun. We, oh, and I, my favorite part of the trip actually was going to, um, God, what was that place called? It starts with a G, Geelong, uh, which was south a little bit, or I don't know. I don't know where it was, but it was, it was below Melbourne. <laughs> I don't know if that was south or not, but um, it was a little beekeeping club. I mean, it was actually quite a populated beekeeping club, but it was a, a beekeeping club, just a regular meeting. And mm -hmm. Um, they do this thing where before the meeting, they spend an hour just for beginners. So they put two experienced beekeepers in the room with all the beginners and just let them ask questions, uh, before mm -hmm. the meeting even starts. So I was supposed to speak at the meeting, but I got there a little bit early. So they threw me in that room with, um, the two experienced guys who were both commercial beekeepers and mm -hmm. then me, and then all these beginners. And it was hilarious because it was so identical to the U S beekeepers. I mean, other than the accents, it was the exact same dynamic, these two older guys, and they were disagreeing with each other. So someone would ask a question, they would answer it in completely opposing ways and just confuse the hell out of the person who asked. And, and then I was sitting there going, okay, 
he said that because this, and then he said that because this, and they're both true. And you could do either way, you know? Yeah. And, and it was yeah. like, I became like the translator for the new beekeepers. Cause that's what I do is just make beekeeping accessible to people. And I think a lot of, there are a lot of knowledgeable beekeepers who just don't know how to get their knowledge across oh, yeah. um, mm-hmm. in a way that people really understand. So I try to take that and, you know, make it understandable for people. But that was my favorite because it was so funny. And um, it just felt like, it's just so f- how funny how universal beekeepers are and seeing, even though they're all different types of people in the room, there's this general connectedness that is the same no matter where you go oh yeah that's really interesting what did you see environmentally like was it i don't know how much you expected based on your exposure to television and movies and crocodile dundee and all that stuff well i mean i think you expect all of australia to feel like the outback you know Mm -hmm. and it's all red and desolate and but no it wasn't like that at all but i was only on the coast really Um, so I didn't, obviously it's a big country, but, um, you know, I was in Sydney and I was in Melbourne and then I drove down the gold coast a little bit. And then I flew up to the flow hive people. Um, I wanted to go to the reef, but I didn't make it up there. We just kind of barrier reef. Yeah. We couldn't quite fit that in. It just felt like too much. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, Sydney felt a lot like San Diego to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. Melbourne felt like San Francisco, uh, the whole, it felt like I was in California, but as a whole country and with more Mm -hmm. Victorian influence. So like the vibes were very California in my opinion, like, and it was the whole gambit. There's agriculture, you know, there's, there's hipsters, there's art, there's, there's the business people. And like, it was, Mm -hmm. it felt very similar to me. I was, I told that to a few Australians and they really didn't like hearing that they were like California for some reason. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) but then I realized that, you know, San Diego also has a ton of Australian native plants here. And there was this really big commerce between Australia and California because of the gold rush during that Mm -hmm. Victorian era. And so I, I feel like the culture is still somewhat similar maybe because of that. So now, why do you think they were not flattered by that comparison? I think just no other country likes being compared to Americans. <laughs> what? In general. <laughs> don't they like us overall? I don't think so. They don't? <laughs> you don't think so? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess we'll move on. I'm glad the Anderson family liked you and and you had a good time. How much time did you spend with them? Just a day or? Uh, no, I was there for like a week um doing filming and i i stayed in cedar's mom's house uh because she was out of town so i just like crashed at her house and borrowed her car um yeah i know (laughs) um it was so funny no i was like part of the family while i was there it was fun um you know i met like you know cedar it's like everybody's in there you know the nephews working for them and the Mm -hmm. you know they had like all their family working for them and stuff and Um, I got to see Cedar's house and meet his kiddo and, um, we went, we like walked through the forest to the beach and we saw whales and made things out of rocks on the beach and just, you know, it was fun. They're very, um, welcoming, chill people. It's it's sad to me that (laughs) everyone is like, not everyone, but a lot of people have really vilified them and they just have no idea what they're talking about. They're the loveliest people. They're Mm -hmm. real beekeepers. Their invention was made to make beekeeping easier and and easier for the bees as well. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. I just think that I don't understand why it went so awry. And because I always tell people, I think the people who should like the flow hive are experienced beekeepers Mm -hmm. because they're the ones who would benefit the most from it. And they're the ones Mm -hmm. who would know how to handle it and make it work for them if something goes wrong with it. And mm-hmm. the new beekeepers are really not that well suited for the flow hive because things do go slightly awry and they don't know enough about beekeeping mm-hmm. to figure it out. And mm-hmm. and so it's just kind of funny that it, it's really flipped. Like, I don't know why, I don't know why that happened, but it's it seems silly to me. Hmm. Yeah, well, 
it's almost like once someone learns a specific method, that's what they want to stay with. It's primacy. The other thing is, I think some of the older, uh, more experienced beekeepers want it to be uh, very complicated and difficult, and they want it to be kind of distancing from an amateur being able to go in, keep bees, and get honey. If this process is much more involved, and uh, they're the only ones that can do it. They're also the only ones that can sell honey. That's why I think it got a lot of traction with, they're just gonna take all the honey from the bees, kill the bees, and it just makes it too easy. So um, people should not feel threatened by that because as you said, the bees are at the center. And if you haven't learned to manage your bees, whatever you put them in, whatever the harvesting system is, um, you're, they're not gonna do well. So yeah. bees first, hive design and everything else. I actually agree with, you know, what you said about uh, the flow high, the flow super, the way it's managed, especially because it's different in all different parts of the country. That's why here where I am, we're keeping these things out in the snow. Where you are, maybe you can leave that super on all year round the way they do in New South Wales. Do you? Yeah. Okay. So, for example, here, so it's a totally different management technique because uh, we have to get our bees through winter and that flow super can't be on during winter time. Mm -hmm. So it's it's very interesting, and I'm glad you had that experience. So what kind of um, changes are you going to make in the coming years? Like, are you are you on a path? Are you just kind of taking things as they come? Do you have a goal? Where are you headed with your beekeeping? Mm. Well, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm always, I have been at this point for a while where I have to decide do I want to grow my business bigger and have employees or do I want to just stay at a reasonable level and not deal with having employees? Mm -hmm. And um, I think I just want to stay for, for right now because mm -hmm. I, I kind of tried to get employees and then it just didn't really work out. And I'm just like, I don't really want to have to manage other people so mm -hmm. intensely and it's so hard with beekeeping because it really takes, you know, years to get somebody at a level that you want them at to manage right. the bees where you can trust them to manage your hives. And then if they leave, if they move, then you have to start over with someone else. Mm -hmm. And it's this huge investment in time to train someone up. And so you could start with someone who already knows what they're doing, but chances are they do beekeeping differently than you. And then you're going to disagree on how things should be done. And it's just kind of like, well... Um, so yeah, I'm in terms of that and kind of like, mm, I don't know my, my, I would love, you know, my dream, which is completely unattainable at this point would be to have a piece of land that was mine <laughs> that I could have, you know, an example garden, you know, an, ex, you know, example apiary where I do all my classes, where people mm -hmm. can come and there's a little shop where, you know, maybe mm -hmm. there's even an Airbnb you could stay in or something yeah. like that. Like, that's what I would love to have, but I don't have the land. It's completely unaffordable. Um, and, you know, for a while I was trying to save money for it, but then I realized I couldn't get a loan. I, you can't get a loan for just raw land. No one will loan you yeah, money. Yeah, you have that. to have a <laughs> business plan to go with it. Yeah. Even with that, they're like, no, because it's just not that it's too much of a risk. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so I kind of put cooled my jets on that. And now I'm just like, I kind of made my backyard that. So now I'm just having people come to my house. So now I have my example apiary in my backyard. And I just built this big deck uh, with a pergola over it where I've been doing my um, intro class, like outside with a projector. Um, and so I've kind of had to do that instead of having it separate from my, my life and my house, but mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's fun. Now I have a question about liability. So when you bring people to your property, is this uh -huh. already something you, you're dealing with? But if you bring people to your property, see this happen to me, cause I set up this educational building and I yeah. want to bring, I want to bring people here to teach them about bees. And because it's part of a business model, the insurance company, they're going to kill me. Like mm -hmm. the cost of insurance is almost defeated the whole idea of bringing people here to teach them. So how did you navigate that on your property for teaching beekeeping? I just have a waiver and then I have a general liability. 
So, so regular like property general liability business. Okay, liability. and then everyone signs a waiver saying that if they get stung, it's on them. Yeah, kind of. Okay. I mean, the fact is, it's America, and anyone can sue anyone for any reason they yeah. want, whether they've signed a waiver, or you you know, you have insurance or whatever. And the insurance companies are insurance companies, so they're always going to get try to get out of paying you whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And so mostly I just don't think about it. <laughs> okay. And how did you go about composing your waiver? Like, did you find a sample online or what did you do? Um, when, well, oh, when I first, so when I first started, I was doing classes on my own, very informally, like literally in my dad's living room mm -hmm. um, with like 10 people. And then somebody found out I was doing it and he was running a nonprofit that was goal was to educate people on like environmental, like homesteading stuff. Mm -hmm. And so he then took me on as like a teacher through the nonprofit. And I was doing classes through their nonprofit mm -hmm. for, I don't know, a year or two or something. And so when that happened, it really elevated my operation, I want to say, and kind of, I learned a lot doing that with them. And it got to the point where they were really busy and they weren't really contributing that much anymore. And there was no reason to like keep working together. So it was this kind of mutual, like we're going to go our own ways. I'm at, it was at that point that I made my own independent website and had my own signups. And I just, they just let me copy the waiver that they used, um, that their lawyer had crafted. So I just kind of took their waiver that they had. <laughs> And for those who are listening, since you mentioned your website, do you want to say what the website is? It's girlnextdoorhoney.com. Girlnextdoorhoney.com. Okay. And also, so this information and links will be down in the video description for those who are catching this uh, and want to follow up on anything that we're talking about here. So now you've mentioned before that you're an artist, that you were in school for art. Does that mean you did not finish your art degree or... No, I did. I graduated did. with an art degree. Okay. So but how I, has being an artist um, benefited you as a beekeeper or how has beekeeping benefited your art? Well, um, I do think that I have met a lot of beekeepers who are also artists. So I think mm -hmm. there's some crossover there in the skills. And I think what the crossover is, is the ability to really look at what you're looking at. and so when you are making art, you are looking at something and really seeing it, seeing all the details, seeing the exact shape, the exact shade of brown, you know, and then recreating it on the page. And so when you have that ability, you really are good at actually seeing things in a different way. And it's funny because until I started teaching beekeeping, actually not until really recently did I realize that, that was why I would be so confused. I would tell someone, here is a drone and here is a worker. Can't you see how they look different? His eyes are completely, he's, his body shape, everything about mm -hmm. him is different. He doesn't look like a worker at all. And people would just not see it. And that was when I finally realized, you know, I see things differently than other people. I think because I have an artistic ability that mm -hmm. I just, I look at things differently. I mm -hmm. really look at them. And mm -hmm. I think that's a skill that not everyone has and you need it in beekeeping or mm -hmm. it's very beneficial if you're, you know, that's a good skill to have when you're a beekeeper is the ability to like look at those details, really see things, you know, and that was partly what, um, you know, I didn't really realize it at the time. That was partly why I wrote Queen Spotting was because the reason I wanted to make that book was because I was in all these Facebook groups and I was teaching people in person and nobody could find the queen and nobody was good at it. And, and all these beginners were just couldn't, they didn't know what the queen looked like. And still to this day, when you go in the Facebook groups for beekeeping, it's like people posting pictures of drones. Is this my queen? And yeah. half the comments say yes. Yeah. And I'm like, what? <laughs> You know, like not a, they're so wrong. They're like convinced that they're right. I just didn't, you know, it was like, it's outrageous to me. So that is why I wrote Queen Spotting. Um, and I really wanted people to look, see her. And I, I would tell my students, like, if you mark her with paint, you'll only just look for the paint. You sure. won't learn yeah. what she actually looks like. So that yeah. when the day finally comes that she croaks or something happens or they clean the paint off her or whatever, you won't be able to find her because the paint is gone. 
and it's a crutch and you don't know yeah. what her actual body looks like, how she moves because you haven't been practicing looking for her. You've been just looking for that little dot. Yep. <laughs> so that was kind of, there's, there's, I feel like there's a connection there with art. And then mm -hmm. as far as the other thing is like, like I said, when I graduated, there was no jobs for art available mm -hmm. to me. I couldn't figure out how to break into any of those fields. There was a point where I was like briefly contemplating doing costume design. I even went to like a seminar for costume design. And the whole time the people there tried to just convince everyone that it was a horrible career and they shouldn't do it unless they absolutely loved it and really wanted to do it, which is yeah. what everybody says in creative fields. You know, it doesn't pay. You have to work like crazy. It's so hard to get in. And, you know, um, but what beekeeping has done for me is it's given me this outlet to do all of the things that I love just under the theme of bees. So I get mm -hmm. to write, I get to do creative writing about bees. I get to do art about bees. You know, I get to, I get to teach, I get to speak, I, you know, I get to, um, I, now I'm taking photos and sharing them with people. I'm making video mm -hmm. content. Like I get to be, I get to be very creative. I design my own honey logo. I design my whole website. Like, I didn't physically make it, but I designed how I wanted everything to look. Mm -hmm. um, I was actually got to be very involved in the interior page design of Queen Spotting. Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't get to illustrate the little book of bees, but I got to tell the illustrator exactly what I wanted. And then she mm -hmm. illustrated it. So it's like, I get to, I've been like very involved in the creative side of the books. Um, and so that's been fun, you know? And I, yeah, and I like, well, I like everything you just said, because um, people that do eye tracking studies and things like that, I have uh, a brother-in-law that's heavily involved in AI and how people interact with things they're looking at. And you're right, an artist looks at details and abstract portions of an image that others just don't. Uh, there's a way of looking at things that artists are, are trying to kind of reassemble it in their own mind and where a person who's not artistically minded looks directly at whatever the subject is or the brightest thing in the composition and things like that. So you're exactly right. And I think that artists do have a huge advantage uh, when it comes to conceptualizing even what, like in your case, the books and the layouts of the books and things like that, but also in innovations in beekeeping, that somebody who's kind of partially engineer minded and artistically capable then they're seeing things beyond what they are right now in front of them. And I think you have a huge advantage in that. And I think that's fantastic. And um, and I'm sorry that you couldn't find a career, but not sorry that you couldn't find a career in art because now you're this, this bee person that um, is really interacting with the world you know, today. And the digital, what we're doing right now has facilitated that. So I think that's really interesting. And so you might just stay doing what you're doing. Where do you think beekeeping is headed overall? Um, backyard beekeepers are growing in numbers. We are not the greatest um, number of hive holders, but that demographic of small scale backyard, more intimate beekeeping is really on the rise. And uh, how do you feel? How do you sense that? Or how is that making itself known to you where you are? Uh, well, for me, it's good for my business because then there's a lot of new beekeepers to teach all the time. Um, it's, it is interesting to see it because I kind of started just before the rise began. And so, you know, for years when I started my business, I had no competing businesses. There was no mm -hmm. one doing what I was doing at all. And now there's like three or four competitors and some of them were like former students of mine who like took my class and then went and made a business oh. just like mine. And so there's this kind of like awkward thing of like, I'm teaching people and then they go and teach people and either become like an actual business competitor or they just for free are teaching people, you know, and now yeah. I'm not teaching people and getting paid. So I, I don't know, it's it's interesting, you know, being a business owner in this too. Like if I didn't, if I didn't charge for what I do, I would have to have a full-time job. And there mm -hmm. was no way I would be able to do what I do. Like right. what I making the books and making all the, the classes and having the time to do all the classes and mentoring and all that. I would not have time to do it. 
So sometimes mm -hmm. I get shamed for charging people for things like removals and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but the fact is like, if I didn't charge, I wouldn't be available to mm -hmm. do anything. And that was what my life was like when I had my office job. I was working 40 hours a week. I was catching swarms on my lunch break. I was saying no to everything. People were emailing me all the time asking for stuff. Sorry, I can't. Sorry, I can't. Sorry, I can't. And now yeah. I can say yes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's like, there's this weird thing. I'm not quite a hobbyist, but I'm not a commercial beekeeper. And I'm in this kind of weird in-between thing that there mm -hmm. isn't really a name for. And then the the number of small beekeepers is growing. And a lot of them have ambitions to do like what I do, because they see what I'm doing and they're like, wow, that's so cool. Your life is the coolest. And people really idolize it. And especially because of social media, I'm, you know, I'm putting these cool videos up and people see it and they think it's cool. And that makes them want to become beekeepers. And it makes them want to do my life, <laughs> which is just kind of odd. You know, it's very mm -hmm. odd to know that I'm influence people so directly. Um, <clears throat> I don't know. I think there's this real desire to go back to this almost agrarian lifestyle of providing our own food and getting more involved in the environment and the, in the ecosystem. But there's still this incredible ignorance about our impacts on things. And I'm hoping, I mean, I believe that most people who become beekeepers build a greater connection with their local ecosystem mm -hmm. and then it changes the way they see the world and leads to positive changes in other areas of their lives like mm -hmm. maybe they realize their neighbors are using pesticides and they talk to them about it you know they're sharing about bees with their entire network of people because once you become a beekeeper you start telling everyone about it and everyone ends up learning about bees because of you um and that it's this ripple effect so i really think that that is a positive thing but then, of course, I am concerned about, you know, the research coming out about harming native bees, um, mm -hmm. that having bees is harming native yeah. bees. Um, I, you know, I don't love hearing that. And I don't think any of us like hearing that. But it's also like now it's kind of what happens is these scientists do research and they're trying to find answers and they never quite find an answer. They just gather information and it mm -hmm. accumulates. And it's one study in one place over one period of time. Mm -hmm. And the great majority of, you know, the seasons and all the variables. And it's impossible to like really fully study something no matter how much you do it. Mm -hmm. And so you just build this body of evidence that goes, uh oh, right. Maybe we're harming native bees. Mm -hmm. um, but then the media takes that and puts a headline on it, you're killing the native bees, mm -hmm. beekeepers, you know, and then the general public reads that and then they come on your YouTube and yell at you for mm -hmm. killing the native bees. And, and their understanding of it is like minuscule. It's a headline's worth of understanding. Right. And, but they're going to just argue with you and send you the articles th that have mm -hmm. those headlines without actually reading the studies. And so I just feel like, I don't know. I, I'm very like, I've always been conflicted, but I kind of feel like what's happening right now is that bees are being, honeybees are being made into a scapegoat for larger environmental issues that are really harming all bees and lots of other species as well that we're largely responsible for, <laughs> like mm -hmm. loss of habitat, pesticides, mm -hmm. climate change. Like the studies say that honeybees impact native bees by outcompeting for forage when forage is scarce when forage is scarce. That's the key thing. So why do we have to demonize honeybees? Can't we just focus on let us make more natural forage? Let's stop mm -hmm. paving everything. Um, so like, I am a little bit concerned. It's a, I have the, like all these conflicting things because I have a business that teaches new beekeepers. So it's great that mm -hmm. there's so many new beekeepers. But I don't want to be doing harm, you know, right. um, but I also get very annoyed that I have to now have these people come at me and argue with me about a subject that they know very little about, assuming that mm -hmm. I also know very little about it when I've done a lot of research into it and thought about it a lot and think about mm -hmm. it all the time because it's my life and it's mm -hmm. my passion, you know, so it's, it's a weird time. I don't know what's going to happen. That's a lot. <laughs> But yeah, you're right. Um, people have a habit of researching an opinion they already have. Yeah. So when they do that, they're just seeking reinforcement for what they've already decided is true. 
And when you research that way, you'll find some reinforcement for it. Yeah. Uh, if you look at native bees and watch the way they pollinate, and particularly, I like this book. There's another bee that's in here that's endangered or maybe even instinct that's the largest bumblebee ever, and mm -hmm. it looked like a flying mouse. I want to see that bee so bad. But um, if people have seen bumblebees, just for example, foraging and watch honeybees forage, honeybees forests, uh, they forage in a floral constant way where a lot of native bees like the bumbles can go from a variety of different species of plants that your honeybees don't even have access to. Okay. So forest diversity, environmental diversity, super important and something. That's where our emphasis needs to be, really. And the honeybee does not outforage a variety of native bee species. We do have native bee species that are um, also specific to one kind of flower, like sunflowers, for example, Apis melissides would be on the sunflowers, but uh, honeybees are not displacing them. And, and I've spent a lot of time because video is something you really can't argue with. Mm -hmm. So when you see a, a native bee on a flower and a honeybee shows up and realizes the native bees there and the honeybee bugs out, literally, then the other bee has kind of priority on these blossoms. There was a Vermont, University of Vermont study that showed that uh, honeybees were potentially passing on disease to the blossoms to some of the bumblebees there. But there was a very specific zone where that was happening in close proximity to large commercial beekeeping operations. So if you take that out of context and simply say, honeybees that are not native are passing on some of these diseases to native species, then they use this broad brush and assign it to every bee everywhere. And uh, that's kind of what we're up against. And you're right, even when you research it from your perspective, which is kind of trying to find that maybe that's not true, uh, it's everything is so much is inconclusive. And that uh, in this country, unfortunately, it has to have uh, economic value to really get the resources pooled to do these studies. And if it goes against where the big money is, now we have pushback. That's why we have monocultural farming. I'm just saying this for the benefit of listeners. I already know that Hillary knows. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh yeah, I wanted to say something. When you get called out to do swarm collections, can you describe um, an interesting person that you met uh, on one of those calls, like a surprise interaction with people that just happened to be there that uh, either you learned something from or there was just some really unexpected uh, lasting interaction there. From doing a swarm removal? Yeah, you show up for the swarm removal and you know, it's it's a already where you live, I can only imagine there are already people around, you know, like where I live, it might be in the middle of the woods and you had to take an ATV to find it. But uh, in a city, people come up and you end up talking to people about bees. And sometimes you make a surprising connection. Has that ever happened? Um, kind of, I guess. I mean, I've had lots of memorable experiences doing removals. I, well, I guess I could tell you one time I did a removal um, for a couple and it turned out that they were very good friends with um, the singer songwriter, Jason Mraz. And then as a result of doing that removal for them, all of them, those people and Jason Mraz and his girlfriend, now wife, came to my intro to beekeeping class. But we did not know that that was happening. It was just, this was when I was teaching for the nonprofit. And so the head of the nonprofit emailed me and said, we just got a sign up from an email that says Jason Mraz. And I'm not sure if it's real Jason Mraz or not, but it might be. <laughs> and like, and then they showed up and it really was Jason Mraz in this like 30 person class in like a rec center. Mm -hmm. And most of the people there didn't know who he was. <laughs> but like, it was, it was just a funny thing that happened. Um, and then, you know, I, I was at a dinner later that's put on by, um, an, another nonprofit that where I keep bees for the founders um, at their house in La Jolla. And it's like this very huge farm to table dinner. And Jason Mraz came to that. And I was sitting at a table and he came and sat down next to me. And he was like, this is the celebrity I've been wanting to talk with <laughs> to me <laughs> because of my um, Instagram, like just making a joke. 
And I talked to him for like five seconds before he got pulled away by everyone, you know, wanting to talk yeah. to him. But it was funny. So that was a surprising well, thing, I guess. Well, that's the other thing, too. When you show up places, do people recognize you? Are they like, oh, my gosh, it's Hillary Cooney. I didn't know she was going to come get the bees. Uh, sometimes. Uh, just very, very occasionally. I'm always really thrown off when it happens because I'm just not prepared for it at all. I'm always like, what? I'm so confused. Um, sometimes people don't even acknowledge the fact that they recognize me. They'll just say something that, that they know about my life. Like, how's your son Kit doing? Or your house is so cute or whatever. And I'm like, what your house you? Is so cute. <laughs> you know um but then i remember like oh yeah i'm doing this weird thing where i share my life on social media um yeah so yeah i think the place that i it happened the most was i went to go see tom seeley speak um yeah. at the natural history museum and i was in line waiting to talk to him and get my book signed and it was the same year that queen spotting had come out his, his book came out, one of his mm -hmm. books came out. And, um, so I was in line and I wanted to give him a copy of queen spotting and I, I wanted to get my book signed from him and, um, people in line recognized me like, Oh my God, I follow you. And, da -da 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 -da, and I, had, I have your book yeah. or whatever. And so that was kind of funny because it was like, we were there to see Tom Seeley, but it was the exact audience that might also know me. So then people were coming up to me. I saw a picture of Tom Seeley looking through your book. I think yeah. it was at a at a book signing or something like that. I Is think that it right? was probably the picture that I took of him when I handed him the book at his. Oh, it was. I, but that would be like my it. guess, unless somebody else did it. What year did that book come out? Two thousand nineteen. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay, so it was back then. Because I. So how did you feel? It. How did you feel when Tom Seeley was thumbing through your book? What kind of comments did he make? Oh, well, what was really funny is that he immediately, I said to him, I kind of explained the concept of the book. He knew about it because we were both on the Amazon, like category top three or something. We were like competing for number two spot or something like that. And so he said, oh, I saw your book on Amazon. It's doing well or something like that. And he knew about it. And then um, I kind of explained, oh, the queen spotting pages go from easy to hard. So it gets harder as you go through the book. So he immediately flipped to the very last. He just flipped the book over and opened the last page and tried to find the queen, um, which I thought was really funny. How did he do? He got it. He got it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I like it because some of them are actually really well hidden. You've got a queen in there that's half buried, that's laying an egg. You know, there's these little tells in there. So I do like that it is, you know, ranked by how difficult they are. I like that book. But, and did he get a copy of it? Yeah, that I just handed him uh, a copy to give him and then um, had him sign his his book that I had bought. And um, he had me sign his copy of Queen Spotting. So it was mm -hmm. cool. He's very nice. I mean, oh, he's the nice. Even if guy. my book had been terrible, I'm sure he would yeah. have behaved the same way. <laughs> he, very nice guy. Very patient and just the best. Um, so what was I going to ask? You have, uh, so since you're doing artwork, are you doing any bee-centric paintings or is like if somebody's listening, is there a place where they can look at your art or are you selling art anywhere? Do you have a, a gallery affiliation, um, anything like that? I don't have a lot of, this is like the piece of my life that I really want to make more time for. So mm. that I seem to not be able to have time it's weird. Like, I feel like I have to be motivated by something connected to the business in order to mm -hmm. invest time in it. It's like this weird mentality of like, um, so I, you know, I did a couple of B paintings and then I tried to sell prints on my website, but I really didn't sell very many. So I was like, all right, this isn't a good use of time. So I haven't really done any more of those. Um, but then I, people are always wanting to use my photographs. I constantly get emails from people you know, can I use this photograph? Da, 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 da. So, um, oh, and then my book that's coming out, my next book that's coming out in the fall, it was originally supposed to be illustrated and I was going to illustrate it. And I let's was- Let's go so, ahead. Let's, I hate to cut you off. Go ahead. Let's talk about that book right now um, because I've seen some of those photos and they're epic. Mm -hmm. So um, 
please go ahead and describe, you know, we've got queen spotting, we've got the little book of bees, and now coming out later this year, we have your next book, which I'm over the top impressed by. Would you like to give us a little kind of description of what that's going to be? Sure. It's called Heart of the Hive, and it's going to be, it is a really in-depth look at honeybee behavior. So it's kind of taking you through the life of the colony and how it works and what the individual bees do in lots of detail. And it's kind of, I took the studies, you know, that I read a ton of research and I took the studies on behavior that I thought were the most fascinating and kind of work them in to the text in like a playful way. So the whole goal of the book is I feel like more beekeepers should be reading honeybee biology books mm -hmm. and knowing more about how honeybees live without a beekeeper, because I feel like that should be the foundation of what beekeeping is learning from the bees themselves. The bees are the best beekeepers and build up from that. Mm -hmm. But not many beekeepers do that. They just read the how to beekeeping book. They get a nominal understanding of how bees work and then they just start keeping bees. So, um, there, there are a lot of biology books and bee behavior books, but they're fairly mm -hmm. dense and mm -hmm. hard to get through and not that accessible to the average beekeeper. So I wanted to make a book that was getting across information that I thought would be useful for beekeepers to know, interesting for them to know, but in a fun and playful, entertaining way. Um, and so that that's what that book is. And mm -hmm. um, originally I was going to illustrate it, but then it took me three years to write the book. I got a new editor in the process. My publisher was bought by a bigger publishing house in that three years as well. And when my editor got the writing, she said, this writing is so good. It's really more like a nature book. And it would it's nature writing like on the high level and should be marketed to a larger audience, not just mm -hmm. beekeepers. Mm -hmm. And thus we want to employ the photographs of a professional photographer and make it more of like a nature writing. Um, so it'll appeal to more of a nature writing audience, I guess, and not mm -hmm. just the niche market of beekeepers. Right. Um, and so they took, um, they contacted Eric Tournament, uh, who I don't know if I'm pronouncing his last name right. Sorry, Eric, if I you no. know, <laughs> met him, but they, he's, he's famous for his bee photos and travels all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, and he, I, I knew his photos, you know, I knew his photos from National Geographic and they get shared all over the place. And um, they said, we want to use his photos. And I said, well, what about we use my photos? Yeah. And said, no. <laughs> they so, shot, didn't they even look at your photos? No. Uh, well, they had seen them from Queen Spotting. It's my photos in Queen Spotting. Oh, those of uh, the frames yeah. and stuff, but the ultra but macro, the the ultra macro stuff. Too. Those are mine too. And so all almost all the Queen Spotting photos are mine. Not just the Queen Spotting images, but the other photos in that book. Right. Are mine. Um, except for the ones of me, those were taken by a professional lifestyle photographer. Um, the things of you, okay. Not, not the actual photos of me. I didn't take the ones of myself, but most of the photos in there were taken by me. Um, oh, but anyway, yeah, great. they said, they said no. Yeah, that one's mine. Yeah, that's great. So they, they shot you down. Yeah, well, they I said was... no to illustrations and they said no, but I do, I did get to draw the anatomy line drawing. Oh, I like those, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I drew those. those. Really good. Yeah. So I got to do that. Um, and yeah, so the book is very different from what I originally thought it was going to be. So it was kind of like a difficult process to come around to the vision that they have for the book. Mm -hmm. But I think... I think they're, you know, they're the professional booksellers. So I, mm -hmm. at a certain point, you just have to trust them. It can be mm -hmm. hard to give up creative control of what you are doing. But it honestly, it was such a struggle to write this book. I can't, I can't emphasize it enough. It was a struggle to finish it. And I only just finished writing it this summer. And I felt so free after three years of having it weigh on me, like missing another deadline, missing another deadline. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm very excited that the book is now done and basically out of my hands and they are going to do their magic with it and hopefully people like it. And um, 
I, do, I can't, you know, at a certain point, I had to just say to myself, Hillary, you are getting upset about having an award-winning, professional, famous photographer's pictures in your book. <laughs> like, it's, there are worse things, you know? No, but it is It is hard. Uh, yeah. When you have a background in art and your heart and soul's into it, and we all know when you get that photo, and yeah. it's just the best the witness to that behavior, you know, that little worker emerging out of its cell, whatever it is, if we get excited, we get that up on the screen. Uh, when I got, you know, the preview of your book, I called my wife over to look at the pictures because I said, ah, that's my picture. I take pictures just like that, you know, because I shoot for Getty. And so I take these ultra macro. I said, look at that for Vosquez, Come on. I have a picture. We have pictures that are so similar, but I loved it. I was blown away. I said, this is just like my picture, only a little better, but it's yeah. so good. You know? And so I that's the exact same thing going through the book. I'm like, this is like mine. Yeah. Mine, it's a little better. But okay, so it maybe he used a hustle blot or something. I was Who the cares? Same. But there were yeah. some pictures that he didn't have that I wish I could have put mine in there for just certain things. But mm -hmm. um it, he just also has a different style than me. Like my style is very colorful and bright mm -hmm. and I like to use natural light. And I really hate how, um, when you can see that it's an unnatural light shining on sure. it. Yeah. I don't like that style of like the dark hive pictures with the bright light, artificial sure. light on them. Yeah. Um, and so the, just stylistically, like he has a huge catalog of photos that I got to go through mm -hmm. and pick my favorite ones. And oh, you of, selected those pictures? Most of my picks are in there. Most of my selected okay. photos okay. are in there. So I, I did get to decide, you know, to some extent which photos were in there. And just but, for somebody that's anxiously listening to this, when will they be able to see this book and when will they have access to it? It's supposed to come out September 3rd, 2024. September 3rd, 2024. So we have a little bit of a okay. wait. Fall. Yeah, wait. All right. Will there be, a, for example, a listing on Amazon that you can pre-purchase or pre-order? I'm sure there will. It's not up there yet. And I'll probably okay. do the same on my website, too. Okay. As soon as we have something. like the, It's not finalized yet. So like you have a, you have like a pre-copy um it's what okay. we call second pages so it's like i've gone through it once and said change this change this change this and mm -hmm. then you've got the version after that and then they sent me the same copy they sent you and i'm going through saying can we have this photo instead can't we have another photo here i don't like the way this text lines up <laughs> you know like so i go through it all and yeah make it. is that part of your frustration like <clears throat> with just in general. I not mean, getting, not getting you. <laughs> kind of, well, no, I think I'm just like that. I'm just very particular about aesthetics because okay. it's my, it's like my thing. Like if something doesn't look right, I, it bugs me, you know? So certainly I've let some things go. I've had to let some things go. I don't have complete, I'm sure I'm annoying the crap out of the book designer, whoever that yeah. horse is. Well, so just pick one image that they brought in or that you selected that absolutely impressed you, just do your best to describe it for somebody who can't look at it. What I, is an image that just impressed you to death? Well, they're all very impressive, but the one mm -hmm. that um, I like is the one of the queen flying. It's essentially a queen on either a practice flight or on her mating flight. And so she's in the air with just blue sky behind her. And it is a sharp macro photo of a flying queen. Mm -hmm. It's just a gob. Like, I don't know how he got that shot. I just mm -hmm. imagine catching a queen in flight. Number one, that's hard mm -hmm. to do. Number two, to get a sharp image like that. I have no idea mm -hmm. how he did that. Um, so I was really impressed by that photo, just being someone who takes pictures of bees. Yeah. Um and I also really, you know, I also really like the, um, there's one of a, a, a drone comet that I think is really cool mm -hmm. that you don't get to see photos of that very often. Mm -hmm. So all the mating pictures are cool. He has, um, he has two queens fighting each other as well. That's pretty rad. Um, but 
my, I love the image, but I hate that you can see the artificial light reflected in the honey. Like this is where I would, yeah. if it were my photo, yeah. I would have photoshopped out the light. <laughs> like sure. I would have, it would have annoyed me so much that I would have photoshopped it out. It's a, um, it's a, it's a fun thing to do to look at a photo and then take apart exactly how it's lit exactly with the vantage yeah. point. No, it is. It's, that's yeah. an exercise we used to do uh, when I taught photography is look at the image, tell me how it's lit, where was the photographer, what's the vantage point, the whole thing, you know, and it is a lot of fun, but I also understand sometimes when you're just shooting with ultra macro, because we're up to 5x macro now, it's more than one to one, um, even the best equipment that money can buy, you're you're often, you know, you're doing manual focus. So some guys have that little stick sticking out, which is a fixed focal distance from the end of that front element. And you're putting that little stick where your subject is, but you've got a queen in flight. I don't know how I did that either. So that I, would be like, we're we're kind of decoding a magician here. Like how did they, but yeah, so you think they should. be luck, <laughs> you know, like I know well, a lot of they, 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 they shot luck. a thousand photos and this is the one they got, you know? Yeah. I'm and, excited because we can shoot an image now at a 30,000th of a second. Yeah, that that I get excited over that kind of stuff because it looks like that bee was dead and its wings are perfect like this and it's in the air and the detail is extraordinary. Now, what do you use when you're trying to get the ultimate photo for yourself? What kind of well, what's your setup? Gonna... Are you using only natural light, only available light? Mostly. So you don't. I, okay. I mean, I was just going to say, like, I'm not really I feel a little bit like an imposter when people give me credit as being a photographer. So like on the one hand, I was mad that my publisher wouldn't use my photos, but on the other hand, I feel very amateur um, photographer wise because I am totally again, self-taught and didn't study it. Even though I, I studied art, I didn't study photography. Okay. I, I did painting, drawing and printmaking. So mm -hmm. um, I actually don't have a formal background in photography and I mostly, use my iPhone or I have this little point and shoot, um, Olympus TG six camera that I really like. It has a macro yeah. setting on it. And, um, it's just, it fits in my beekeeping pocket. That's why I like it yeah. because it fits in the suit of <laughs> fits in my yeah, suit your, pocket. And I can your have iPhone with... when you were in uh, Australia, did you meet Mirabai? Yeah. And did she show you her phone? She does yeah, everything. Mirabai, Mirabai came out to San Diego before I even came to Australia and we hung out while she was here and okay. she did um, a little video on some of my students and we went and got margaritas together and she's really fun. I love her. Um, she, she's so talented and she's so humble too, because I think I was like in her company and I said something like, I really wish I could get one of my photos in an iPhone commercial you know, a B photo that I've taken with my iPhone and she had already done that. <laughs> like, yeah. she, you know, she didn't um, tell me. She was just like, oh yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. She, she has, had already achieved that. She has a short film out that was entirely done with her phone. Yeah. They film everything so. at Flow Hive with phones. I know. Yeah. yeah. I know. Which, by the way, now the phones are just extraordinary. You can, yeah. I pick my, I'm not going to lie, I choose my phone based on the cameras it has. That's it. I that's, do too. That's, but that's all, all I, care I about. honestly care about. And, and yeah. the amount of storage, because I have, like, if I look in my phone right now, yeah. you want to guess how many photos I have in here? They're almost all B photos. You better unload those right away. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's the 40, 40,307 uh, photos. Okay, Hillary, you really need to have a backup plan. And by that, I mean a physical backup plan. Well, Get I have those iCloud. Things. Okay, I don't do that. Um, I don't do anything to the cloud because I don't want my phone to pause even for a second. But like, And you're using the iPhone. I use the Samsung uh, Galaxy Ultra S23 right now because it can shoot super slow motion. So 900 frames per second in full 1080p which in the past it was like 720 by 480 or something really lame but um, cool. people cannot tell the difference between that and my cinematic equipment once i put it together and it's edited and i release it from premiere pro you can't tell which is very disappointing to me which one is the phone and which one is the rig yeah that's where we're at today so it's wild. 
and having that in your pocket. And whenever you see something amazing, you just break out your phone and you've got all your lenses and it goes to macro or whatever you have. What a fantastic advantage. I, think I started it, telling all my students to take pictures in their hives because it, what would happen is they would see something and they wouldn't know what it was. And mm -hmm. then they would come to me and they would try to describe it. And I'm like, I have no idea. You know, it's brown. It was sticking right, yeah. out. Like, what? Yeah. And I'm like, so I started telling everyone, I was like, bring your phone, take pictures. If you have something you don't mm -hmm. understand, if you're not sure, if you think you don't have eggs, if you're yeah. not sure, you know, take a picture, take a bunch of pictures and send them to me and I will tell you. And there have been several times where somebody sent me a picture, said they didn't have any eggs or they couldn't find their queen. They thought they were queenless. And I could see, I just zoomed in on the picture and circled it and sent it back to you them. There's the it. egg, there's yeah. the queen. And yeah. um, really recently, actually, this was so funny. I had a student that I was mentoring and um, she needed to find her queen because she was um, combining two colonies or something. I can't remember what, but she needed to find her queen. And there was just a small, really tiny amount of bees in there. They were like a dying colony with just a queen. And we were going to combine them. That's it. We were going to combine them with a queenless nuke um, just mm -hmm. to bolster their numbers. And so I wanted her to cage her queen to protect her during the introduction period. Mm -hmm. And um, she couldn't find the queen. And it was just this tiny little group of bees. And she said, can you come back out and, you know, it's like a 30 minute drive and da 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 to come out there. And, and I said, no, put me on uh FaceTime. I'm going to find her on FaceTime, hold up yeah. the phone. And so she's, her husband's holding the phone and it's all shaky too. And I can barely see what's going on. And I saw her and I was like, she's right there in the corner in that little pile of bees. I saw her butt. She's in there and they, they got her. And it was all just over FaceTime. Think uh, about that, so that advantage. That. What, what an extraordinary advantage right now we have to even do that. Yeah. And maybe, have you considered making uh, photography part of what you teach uh, beekeepers? I do uh, beekeeping. I, I do a bee photography class, actually. It's, okay. Um, I usually do it once a year. The first couple of times I did it, I had a ton of signups. But then last year, like almost no one signed up. So I don't know. I, I do it as part of my mentorship program. So mm -hmm. I do this like eight month long mentorship program that starts in January and goes through the fall. And I do like live taught online classes. And then I also mm -hmm. do like office hours where we meet on Zoom and we just pick, he, they can just pick mm -hmm. my brain and we can talk about their personalized stuff. And so as one of the um, features of that, I do a photography class. And that, that was actually one of the most the classes I got the most feedback from, from the people in the mentorship were like very excited to improve their photography skills. And they okay. were sending me their pictures and how do you think I did and stuff like that. I'd give them feedback. That's um, hard. That's, <laughs> that's the hard between me and you and nobody else. I don't like people to send me a bunch of pictures to look at. <laughs> I don't I just, I think it takes fun. time. That's a huge chunk of time to give a meaningful. <laughs> remember, you can destroy them in a word. I don't do that. I just give them the positive feedback. Okay. And then I give them a gentle suggestion for what they could do differently next time. Yes. I always build a sandwich. That's yeah. really interesting. I'm glad you took the time to do it. You picked a great time of day. It's completely out of focus. Now, what can you do after that? So that you just get oh, there. I was going to say something else. I, um, because of the publisher not wanting to use my photos, and then they sent me Eric's website because of that. And because whenever I'm upset about something, I try to turn it into some constructive thing. Mm -hmm. I decided that I was going to make my own photography website. So I finally did do that. And it's hillarykearney.com. And so oh. I put my favorite um, B photographs on that website. And now you can buy prints and um like metal prints or like canvas prints or whatever and it's all just drop ship from this printer so i don't even get to see them but um you can order it's just an easy way for people to oh and you could buy digital versions that was the thing i was going to say so if you do a presentation for your local b club or whatever yeah. and the problem is that you just there just aren't photos of what you want or it's hard to find mm -hmm. a good photo or you don't mm -hmm. have permission to use it or whatever um, so mm -hmm. now you can use, I put a bunch of photos that I thought would be useful for B presentations on there um, as well. So, and you can just mm -hmm. buy a digital download of it and use it, um, you know, in your PowerPoints. 
And I really like that you did that because that gives you somewhere to send these people to and say, can I use some of your pictures? I'm doing a PowerPoint. The other thing is people that prepare professional PowerPoints and sell them. Yeah. That's a category. Um, right now there's no, that, I look at I them. <laughs> Pardon? I should probably do that, but I haven't. Yeah. So a ready PowerPoint on setting up your first hive, things like that with your photography. There's a market for it because I do those checks and look for those things. Um, I sell rights and use to my photography through Getty. So Getty Images handles everything. And it's all I do is send my stuff there and I just get paid at the end of the month or whatever. So um, that eliminates when people write. I just say, oh, well, go to this gallery. So yeah, it is exactly. there. There is a market for because just as you said, all these people are teaching beekeeping. There's a lot of beginner courses. The beginning beekeeping is the number one search part, which you probably already are familiar with. But if you provided packaged slideshows, yeah, a lot of people don't realize that you have to have rights to use an image. Let's go ahead and deal with the elephant in the room. People, because we see these PowerPoint presentations and we know they just, you know, copied and saved and pasted and you're being paid to give a presentation. When you're doing that and it's somebody else's work, that you have not obtained the rights to use, that's a violation. I just think a lot of people just don't know that that's the case. Yeah, but, that, I run into that quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I have a whole album that's my work I find being used by others. It's on my, <laughs> it's on my, it's on my Pinterest. So it's pretty funny. It's funny to me because it's stuff that it, it's a waste of time to go after people. But yeah, it's not you a just green have to light. Laugh. It happens That's not so a green light, though, that you can take my stuff. I won't come after you. I'll come after you with Photoshop and it won't be fun. So. Um, all right. What's your most exciting uh, B tool that you discovered in your adventures as a beekeeper? Most exciting B tool? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like what's some new tool? Maybe it's a. Uh, a I high guess, scale, some kind of sensor, a fancy oh, bee. I was going to say that I started using an oyster shucker instead of a hive tool. Um, I like that. For my top bar hives, I have this little oyster shucker that I like better because it just fits in your hand and it's so short and you just need that little blade to pry apart the bars. Um, but I haven't really geeked out with a lot of... Uh, equipment or sensors or anything like I haven't really tried a lot of them sometimes people want to send me stuff that they've created and they want me to test it or whatever yeah. um mm -hmm. but I had kind of a bad experience doing that with someone they sent me this thing and I just didn't have time to do it and they kept mm -hmm. asking did you do it yet did you do it yet and I hadn't right. and then they got very angry at me and made me mail it back to them um and they were just super rude. And so I was like, I'm not doing this anymore because I think what people don't understand, it's like, yeah. And they think that you're just so excited to have their thing for free mm -hmm. that they don't realize that it's actually a time investment for me to like set it up and figure out how it works, oh, yeah. and give them oh, yeah. feedback on it. And so anyway, um, it happened like while I was moving, I had just bought a new house and I hadn't had my apiary set up yet. And so it was just like very bad timing. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't have any bees at my house and I, we had no fence when we first moved in. So I couldn't mm -hmm. have hives because I didn't want to just have bees like in this fenceless yard. Um, and so it took us like, you know, eight months to get this fence built. And in that time, this person completely lost it on me over that. So good tool overall. I don't know. I didn't, I never used it. So. <laughs> <laughs> I well, that's, no my, that's my other thing. I don't, I won't allow a rapid, you know, assessment of something. I need to use it. I need to see it for a while. Uh, yeah. It can't be in a hurry. And you're right. It's no gift. Yeah. If, if you look at an advertising budget and somebody's going to reach out to you and say, I'm going to give this to you. And all you have to do is talk about it. Uh, no, your time has value. Uh, yeah. What would I charge? Just what I charge to take pictures of a high school senior, you know, that's time and talent. Now, if somebody sends you a piece and this thing is $19 and I get the privilege of making a YouTube video about it, they're not thinking it's not economically. That's not a good it's a good move on their part if I did it or yeah. if you were super excited about something. Right. 
But it's another thing that's always in the back of my mind. Why would that be worth? I don't like the cold shipment. Like somebody just looked you up, found out where you live and ship you a package. Mm. I'm I'm not excited that's about weird. that. That's weird. People do that to I, you? Yeah, it is weird now that you <laughs> mention it. So, yeah, I've had big boxes just show up. And I'm like, what is that? And then you'll get, there'll be a letter in it. Yeah. That I knew you wouldn't respond to me or something. So I just found out, I hope you don't think this is, you know, and then they send you a whole box of stuff. Wow. Yeah, I'm not, again, I'm not inviting people to do that. Please don't. Because um, today you can basically find out where almost anybody lives. Um, yeah, that's true. So. Uh, okay. Your worst experience with bees where you got stung and hurt the most. Hmm. Do you deal with, do you have Africanized bees there at all? Oh, yeah. So what but, happens? Well, it's not quite how it's made out to look. I mean, we have, they say 80% of the feral bees here have, are Africanized. What that actually means is that 80% of them would test positive for having some percentage of the African got a lot of genes right, right. Um, but they're actually they're also they're hybrids now they're not full <laughs> apis got a lot of they're like they're like you know right Pian, and they're middle eastern and they're you know they have all these other things mixed in so the actual percentage ranges dramatically so you can have feral bees that are totally fine and then you can have ones that are nightmare we call them berserker bees or you know we just actually we usually just say berserker the bees are getting bees? hot <laughs> Our bees are hot. They're getting hot. You know, then no one likes to say the A word. And, um, so we'll just say like, ooh, these bees are hot or they're spicy, you know. They're berserker bees. Okay. Um, yeah. And so I, I've i had several incidents where I was hurt the most, I guess, was kind of early on in when I started uh, beekeeping. I got a call from this woman who lived by herself out in Julian. Um, and she said that she used to have um, birds nesting. She had these huge nesting boxes for some type of bird she used to keep. And they were all filled with bees. And did I want to come just take the boxes away and, and have the bees? And she said she had three of them or something. And at the time, um, you know, I didn't have a great bee suit. I would wear like Carhartt overalls with just the jacket. And um, <clears throat> then I would just like wear like three pairs of socks or something. And my husband was driving a VW Rabbit at the time, which is not a large car for those was of it, you. Was it diesel? It was diesel <laughs> and it's very small. And we drove that thing out there. I don't know what we were thinking. I, we didn't realize how big these nesting boxes are. We thought they were just little like bird nesting boxes, but they were like eagle nesting boxes. They were huge. And um, it was like a horror movie. We we went out there and it was, we forgot that in the mountains it gets darker earlier because the sun's going down behind the mountains. So when we got there it was already dark, like basically sunset, it was cold. Um, we couldn't already couldn't see well, it was like twilight. And so it was too late. I mean, we wanted to get there earlier so that we could see what we were doing and get everything, you know, buttoned up or whatever. Um, because our plan was just to close up these boxes and drive them home and then take a, open them and then do the cutout later. Mm -hmm. Um, and so anyway, it's like these, the boxes were inside these dilapidated wooden structures where the netting and the screen had like half broken. And there was this creepy wind blowing that was like rattling going on. And it's like wind. dark and we're, <laughs> we're all walking into this like horror movie scene yeah. and there's these giant heavy boxes just filled with like 80,000 bees or something. And they were, they had cracks and they weren't, perfectly put together so there was all cracks down the side and then a big hole in the front that just had bees like oozing out of it and so we went back in there and the the lady came with us for some reason even though she wasn't in a suit and she was in front of me so it was like my husband her then me and um my husband just like barely touched one of the boxes and the bees started coming out and they were flying even though it was dark and they were stinging us in the dark and everyone was getting stung and I was like abort, abort mission, everybody get out. Like, I was like, let's go back up, you know? And so it was like this narrow pathway. 
Anyway, everybody got stung a ton that night. Somehow we did manage to get the boxes of bees. We ended up putting a paper bowl over the hole. Uh, we just duct tape all the cracks and then we taped like a paper bowl over the hole because there were so many bees that were like oozing out the front. We couldn't put something flush on mm. there. They like didn't fit in the box. And then we just wrapped the whole thing in a, a big black garbage bag and put it in the back seat of this VW rabbit that we were driving and for 45 minutes or an hour back to the house. And, um, the whole time just increasing buzzing noise, you know, like they're totally getting out of this janky close up we did. And the car is just like filling up with B sound. And I'm like, do you think they're getting out of the bag? Like, I don't know. Should we pull over and get Benadryl and see what's going on? Like, um, and the whole time I remember just telling myself, like, it's probably just one bee and it sounds loud because it's in the plastic and it's just reverberating the sound. But no, when we got home, there were hundreds of bees that had gotten out and they were just trapped in the bag. So thank God we had put the bags on because we almost didn't mm. do that. And um, anyway, that's what I like to call a bee leak when you're driving bees and they escape in your car. Um, and it's happened to me many times, but those bees were very angry with us because it was nighttime and they mm -hmm. hadn't ever been handled by humans. And, mm -hmm. but they ended up being fine. I mean, we did the cutouts later and they weren't particularly okay. defensive or anything. It was just the circumstances. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good news. Cause that was going to be my follow up. How did they end up being? So they ended up being okay bees. Yeah, they ended up being okay. And how was she? So she got stung up pretty bad, too. How was she doing? She I mean, I think people really overreact to bee stings these days. I don't know yeah. why it's such a big deal to everyone to get stung by bees. But it's I mean, it seems like back in the day, people just get stung and it was just whatever you got stepped on a bee. Oh, that sucks. It's not the yeah. end of the world. <laughs> and now people are like, should I go to urgent care? It's swelling up. And I'm like, no, that's what bee stings do, you know? Even no, that if, actually shows that you're healthy. It's yeah, reacting to the it's side a normal, of the sting. As long as it's local to the area where you were stung, you do not need to go to urgent care. So, I mean, she was tough. She didn't seem to, she, I mean, it was probably fun for her. She's living out in the desert by herself and these kooky young people come and t get her all stung and take her bees away in a VW rabbit. I don't yeah. know. That's actually a great story. Um, there was one detail in your new book that I love it when I read a book and I get something new out of it right away. I had not seen this, um, description of behavior between Queens when Queens are emerging and there may be competition between them. One of the Queens sprayed poop on the other Queen. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me, first of all, I want to know how you even learned about that and, Please describe what that is. What is going on with these competing queens? I actually learned about this in Queen Spot when I was writing Queen Spotting because I was researching everything I could find on queens for interesting details about the queen's life that people maybe didn't know. And I had never heard about it either at mm -hmm. the time. And I was just like, what? But I guess, you know, virgin queens have a fecal matter that is different from what they will have later it's like mm -hmm. sweet smelling and attractive like very attractive to worker bees and um after they mate it changes and becomes more like other bees poo but mm -hmm. um so they they during a queen battle apparently quite frequently at least in this one study they observed like i think it was 60 percent of the time one queen would spray the other or try to spray the other with this fecal matter. And what it would do is um, it would sometimes incapacitate that queen because so many worker bees would go to her to try to clean it off of her that mm. she wouldn't be able to move. And then the, the other queen could either have a brief respite from the fight um, or she would just go and sting her while she was incapacitated by the other bees that mm. were, you know, not allowing her to move because they were cleaning her. So, yeah, I thought that was pretty wild. And, that is. Uh, That's interesting. I'm always excited because, you know what, I like to study bees to know things for knowledge sake. Yeah. So, that has no practical application whatsoever, but it's a, a super interesting behavior. And uh, just the idea that they can even do that is just amazing to me. Do you have any um, 
final thoughts or something you'd like to share with viewers and listeners, um, either about yourself or something to do with beekeeping that you just want to share? Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I do. <laughs> okay. Tell us one thing about yourself that most people do not know. One interesting ability, experience, something that people don't know about you. Um, I really like horror movies. Um, yes. <laughs> so I'm a horror movie fan and I have a couple of good friends and it's like our thing to see horror movies. We even like watching the bad ones. Um, yeah. The terrible ones. It's like part of yeah. the joy of, it's great to see a good horror movie. You know, I love seeing a good horror movie, but I also like a bad horror movie. And um, it's really funny because like all of our spouses are not into it and the three of us are. And so it's like, all right, we're going to go see a horror movie. Bye. You know, there is a formula and I like to see that formula abandoned in a movie. So give me. All right. What is your favorite badly done or B movie horror movie? Uh, uh, which one do you collectively celebrate? I don't even, I don't know if I have a favorite, it's hard to pick a favorite, but like what comes to mind is this one, I can't remember the name of it though, so I don't know if I should say it, but it's, it's about a clown, it's about a clown mask that a guy finds in the basement, and when you put it, he puts it on and starts becoming this like murderous clown, and it was a very low budget movie. It's actually not a bad horror movie. I feel like it's well done, but it's super low budget. And I almost want someone to remake it who has a budget because I feel like the story is pretty cool of like putting on this mask and becoming a killer clown. Might just so be he called gets, clown He gets or possessed or something by it. Yeah, he gets possessed. My, I also love the movie Tremors. Um, what? That is so 10 minutes is, ago bad but it's not it's a great movie and the acting is great and it's a great story um there's this new zealand uh horror movie that i love called i think it's called house or housebound have you seen that one i must have put it on I, your I, list put it on your list it's it's a funny horror movie and it's really good and i also like speaking of funny horror movies i like dale and tucker versus evil which is very gory and really funny also. Yeah. Okay. Of course, evil dead. So the, what? What did of you just say? Of course, evil dead. Evil dead. Okay. And an army of darkness and that whole series. The most, I'll share one that it, just because somebody out there might know where to find it, because I saw this movie on VHS tape back in the eighties and it was just called the ceremony. And it was a bunch of college kids. Somebody found this mechanism that they realized was counting down like it was going to open. And then, of course, they get into the ancient history. And, you know, somebody said this is a timing thing that's going to release some kind of spirit or whatever. So they get a bunch of art types, you know, a bunch of friends together. And they're all going to be in this house at the time in the midnight when it's all going to open up and like an actual spirit comes out. But it was uh, it was pretty low budget, but it was also really disturbing. <laughs> At the same time, whoever they got to play the part of the spirit that came out, because they made a protective circle and everything. But anyway, and I made sure and shared it with as many people as I could so that they would have it in their head, too, because I wanted them to be messed up about it. And uh, I've never been able to find it since. It's just called the ceremony. Ceremony. So okay. I want, if anybody finds that, I want to. So it had to be from the early 80s, I'm going to guess, mid 80s. And I want that movie because it gets it has sticking power, you know. I wonder if it'll hold up though, or if it's just your memory. That's just it. Maybe, yeah. Might Wouldn't be it be terrible if now it's like the movies you see when you're a little kid? Yeah. I like this. I like to scare my grandkids with dolls. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to talk about that right now. So anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, old movies that seemed really profound when you're little and all of a sudden when you're older and you have this understanding, it's not so great. So, all right. Well, I want to thank you for doing the interview and I, I'm really happy with the books that you've made. I'm excited about the book that you have coming out for those watching and listening. 
check back for the video description because we'll update that. So when the book is available, if there's a pre-sale or something on Amazon, you'll find that link there. Also, we will have Hillary's uh, channels, both for her photography and also for her beekeeping um, websites. So you can click on that down below. Thanks for watching. And thanks for being here, Hillary. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And that wraps up another episode of Interviews with Experts. Please don't forget to check the updated links and information down in the video description. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be.